Natalia Coachman. I come from Brazil. I'm a second year master's student at MIT. Uh, my name is Emma Gonzalez Roberts. I'm from Minnesota. I'm a first year master's student at MIT. Um, and my background is in community development. We are all city planners. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Won Young and I'm also second year master's student at uh, MIT Dot uh, Urban Studies and Planning. And I'm trained as a graphic designer and uh, uh, I, I specialize in the urban data visualization. So I'll show you a couple of maps and graphs like that. Hi guys, I'm Fiona Tanamajaya. I am also a second year master in city planning student, as with most of us here. Um, and my, my background is mostly in international development economics and environmental economics. Hey y'all, my name is Yair. I'm a recent graduate of MIT, and my background is in commercial real estate. If everyone has questions, like in Portuguese or Spanish, I can help with that. So feel free to ask questions. <coughs> And while we wait to get the presentation, we'd love to go around the room and have you each say your name, um, where you're from, and maybe one thing that you would like to see in the city of Brockton in the future. And there is a sign and sheet working its way around. Yeah. And also, we have, they recommend that we use this. Oh, okay, nice. So maybe we can start sure. here. Awesome. Thanks, guys. There. Hello, uh, welcome to Brockton. Uh, thank you very much for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for putting all this together. Uh, it's great, greatly appreciated. My name is Jeff Thompson. I'm the uh, Ward 5 City Councilor. Emma, I think we uh, had a conversation on the phone. Uh, it was uh, an enjoyable conversation. Um, you're all city planners. Anybody looking for a job? Um, yes. So, um, Again, uh, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the presentation. I uh, see what ideas you came up in this extremely important development project in Brockton. And so um, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, hopefully I'll have some questions and uh, we can have a nice back and forth tonight. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. It's nice to see such smart, diverse, backgrounds, you know, presenting today. That's awesome. My name is Tina Cardoza. I'm from Cape Verde, and I'm the city council at large here in Brockton, and I'm excited to hear what you guys have come up with. Thank you. Just for clarification, the, the microphone is just for the cable system, so it doesn't amplify in the room. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. My name is Amy Winston, and I am a city resident, fourth generation, and my family owns rental properties around Ward 5, so just interested. Hi, my name is uh, John Channel, and congratulations on MIT. I have two, two upper-level degrees from MIT, and I taught at MIT. Uh, I own two businesses, and in Brockton, I've been here 40 years, and I have a home in Hisifi, Brazil, summer home, <laughs> winter home. Hi, I'm Karen Kelleher. I'm not from Brockton, but my parents and my father and my grandparents are. Uh, but I'm here in my capacity as the executive director of LISC Boston, which we are the local office of the National Community Development Entity, and very interested in seeing inclusive growth here in Brockton. I'll skip. I don't know if it's. Hi, I'm Mark Prestawa. I'm a commercial real estate investor. Uh, just very excited to hear the presentation that you have. Uh, tonight and uh, looking forward to it. Hi, I'm George Durante. I am with Mass Development and I'm the uh, TDI fellow for downtown Brockton. Sorry, hi, I'm Emily Hall. I'm with the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, um, Compliance and Community Dr Development. Hi, I'm John Van Kuyken. Um, I work for the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, and I also run the Farmer's Market on City Hall Plaza in the summer and fall. Hi, I'm Pamela Gurley. I work for Rob May, um, but I am a lifetime Brockton resident, so wasn't my mother and my grandmother before her. Hi, my name is Frank Gurley. I'm the chairman of the Citizens Advisory Committee to the BRA. Hello there, I'm Connor Michaud. I work for the Wildlands Trust. Uh, we've been working with the city for almost a decade, so 
just here to learn, listen. Hey, my name is Jason Guerra, uh, commercial property owner, fifth generation resident, Brockton. Um, interested to see the presentations tonight. Hi, I'm Ellie Wentworth, longtime community activist. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lived in the same house in, for 52 years in Brockton, formerly from Boston. Um, I'm very much interested in what we're going to do, wherever it may be, for our homeless uh, population for a day center. That's my biggest interest right now. I know that may not have anything to do, but it may. <laughs> Hello, I'm Frank Devon. I live in the uh, neighborhood that abuts the CS CSX property, and I just came as an interested citizen. Appreciate the invitation. John Messia, Director of Constituent Services uh, in Community Outreach Mayor's Office. Jensen Denoyes, I'm with the mayor's office. I'm the communication liaison for Mayor Sullivan. And lastly, I'm Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of Brockton. Thank you. Back to you. You'll see, we can talk about the report. And I'm Amy Glassmeyer, and I am the professor of this wonderful class of students. For the last three years, we have been guests of your community. Um, I personally uh, have found working in Brockton and working around Brockton and its history enormously interesting, uh, largely because of the role that it played in the state's economic history, the extent to which it's gone through many cycles of development, um, and uh, that it's at this moment now in which uh, there's a lot of opportunities and there's also a lot of challenges. Um, this is the third of three years that we've um, been here working. Uh, the first year, we um, were really interested in the extent to which we're, we're all in, in Kendall Square, right? And so what's going on in Kendall Square Life Sciences? What's going on in Life Sciences? The price of uh, square footage is $100. Brockton is 32 um, we were interested in seeing whether or not it was possible for some of the more employment intensive work in life sciences to migrate out of Kendall because it's uh, really quite impacted and to um, settle in other parts of the state including the gateway cities and so Brockton is one of the gateways where the uh, MIT has actually had 50 reports written over the history of the last 30 years by class projects or by people doing theses on Brockton. So if you ever want to see what people had to say, you can go to something called DSpace, and that's where all the, the student reports and major reports are placed. So if you're interested in industry or you're interested in art or in literature, you can find a, a, a wealth of work that's been done on Brockton. So in the first year, we just did reconnaissance, and we compared Brockton and Worcester because both of them had unusual characteristics that might bring life sciences to those locations. Worcester has a medical school. It's got uh, 10 universities. It's got a lot of infrastructure. Um, Brockton has three train stations, and we're really close to Boston. So when we added it all up, 
Actually, they were very similar, but with different resources. When it was all said and done, we proposed the possibility of working with, continuing to work with Brockton and Worcester. Worcester was chasing a baseball team, and uh, we were actually intrigued by Brockton because it was so close to Boston, and that's how we ended up uh, uh, selecting Brockton and working here. In year two, what we did is do a deep dive into the life sciences potential of Brockton, meeting all of the people in the medical centers and looking at the high schools and the, and the community college and the colleges around here. We spoke to a lot of people who were your resources, the, the capacity of your community to mobilize uh, individuals and opportunities. At the end of that, what we decided was that um, you had really great opportunity. You had resources. You have potential. And yet what we found was that, and the thing that struck us was the, the Prava, the event that was held in the community that brought people together. And that kept coming up. And everybody that we spoke with, we said, so what's new in Brockton? What's new in Brockton? And people would talk about the fact that people were getting together and, and starting to explore and enjoy the downtown. In the third year, we stepped back from life sciences because we felt that before we could really say that we had anything to offer about how life sciences might migrate its way here, was that Brockton was a community that its greatest resource was its people. And that there was a way in which we felt that as planners, our job is to try to figure out not just whether I, as an economic geographer, can get companies from Boston to move down here, but actually whether the citizens of Brockton um, want a future and what that future is. And so after talking to more people and talking to Rob and, and really ourselves doing exploration, we really felt that the most powerful thing that could possibly happen out of this experience was to bring the community together, all aiming toward an objective. So then it just so happened that you got a new mayor, by the way, we were we had spent time with uh, Mayor Carpenter. He came up. There's Travis McCurdy, who is one of our sponsors in the first and the second years. And uh, they, uh, Travis and the, and the mayor got along quite well in our last meeting together. Um, and we were very sad at his passing. Um, but luckily, we, you have a new mayor, and uh, he has a really interesting outlook, an outlook that actually helped us frame our work this semester. Or actually, it's been now uh, uh, almost a full year. So with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn it over to everyone else. And, um, since we did around the room, I do yeah. want to introduce, we have a couple more um, city councilors. We have Maybe more uh, fourth chairs, for them. Castro. chairs for them. We have Ward 5 Councilor um, Jack Lally, and we have Ward 7 Councilor and President of the City Council, Charlie Asak. Any other elected? What? Ward six. six. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Would you like to have work five? I can train. Okay. Go trainers. Thanks, Amy. Awesome, so we're just gonna go ahead and continue with the presentation. Um, we thought it'd be helpful to go over an overview of what to expect during this less than an hour that we have left. Um, we already introduced ourselves here, um, and the general goal here is to introduce the concept of inclusive economic development and how its applications um, may work in Brockton. We'll go briefly over Brockton's historical context so that we can better identify which vulnerable populations um, to prioritize or plan for. We will also discuss um, a framework for inclusive economic development that the team put together. And lastly, we will finish on the One Brockton design proposal. We really want this whole process to be as inclusive as possible. So if you have any questions at any point in time, just feel free to raise your hand and ask. We will also have a dedicated Q&A and feedback session at the very end. Um, we already introduced ourselves during the technical difficulties, so I think we can go past this. Thank you, Young, for your help. I don't think it's working. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't line yeah. up with exactly fit. Okay, so we wanted to level set the room with what inclusive economic development even is. So at its core, it's about implementing strategies, projects, initiatives that improve people's quality of life. And taking an inclusive lens to it means really focusing those initiatives on people who have been uh, historically marginalized or excluded. Um, and so kind of the very first thing we did when looking at 
when get starting with the class was to take a look at literature and inclusive economic development. And one of the big themes, including from institutions like Brookings and the Urban Institute, is that when you use these inclusive practices, it actually improves economic growth um, and quality of life for all. So that's really why we're here and, and why we're excited to focus on inclusive economic development. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the historic context. So it was really important for us as non-residents of the city of Brockton to um, better understand the historic context for the city's growth and to understand which populations may be most vulnerable. Um, so in order to do so, we did both a qualitative and a quantitative assessment of the lay of the land back from Brockton's founding days to what it is now today. Um, my colleague Wan Young worked mostly on the quantitative analyses, and he'll walk through the different geospatial maps that he made, um, which are really interesting. And then the qualitative assessments that we did, mostly composed of dozens of interviews collected over the years from Brockton stakeholders and residents. So to go ahead and get started here, um, for those unfamiliar with Brockton's history, although it sounds like many of you have grown up in the city of Brockton or have had relatives grow up here, um, Brockton was well known for its role in the shoemaking and leather goods industry, um, which started to see a decline around the World War era. Um, and with that, there has been periods of white flight to the suburbs and immigration from mostly Cape Verde and Haiti. Um, which really peaked in the 1980s and 1990s. And so this shift in demographics has really captured our attention when we look at the demographic differences between the 1980s and 2017, um, really just 40 years gap here. Um, as you can see, back in the 1980s, it was a, definitely a white majority town. Um, and as it is now today, it's a minority majority city. Um, so this concept and this demographic shift has really come to play in the different interviews and geospatial analyses that we conducted which have shown that there are two Brocktons, or at least a perception of two different Brocktons. The old Brockton that has repeatedly come up in the interviews and in the analyses that Wan Yang has completed um, are mostly based on white citizens and um, higher incomes versus the new Brockton, which is mostly made up of immigrant populations. Um, our research has also showed that there have been shared challenges by immigrants, much like the different immigrant populations across the United States, um, which may be captured in the lack of proficiency in English or basic um, a knowledge about the services that the city provides. Uh, we will also talk about that and how it contributes to the racial income gap. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> So here I'm, um, here I'm showing a couple of different maps and graphs. So the, here I show the three maps. Uh, it shows a radical demographic shift. So one dot means the five people. So the green dot means the white population. And then the yellow dot means the black or African uh, American population. So as you can see, there's a, hu a very radical uh, demographic, demographic shift in these 30 years. Um, so it's really, really visual. So the, one of the reports says that uh, it's uh, one of the state's most extreme cases of racial transformation in the past 30 years. And then one thing to note is that it's No, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that the well, one thing to note is that the, there's a really a uh, uh, spatial division between the uh, old Brockton and then the new Brockton. Uh, new Brockton is uh, relatively uh, concentrated in the downtown area. It's really natural. <laughs> so here, um, I want to uh, show the sh uh, common shared challenges of the downtown areas people. So one, the, this map shows the uh, citizenship status of the, the downtown area people. So the green dot means the, it's naturalized citizen, which means that they got citizenship after they born. And then the red dot means that it's, um, they didn't get the citizenship status. So the red dot is relatively concentrated in the city, uh, in the downtown area. And the second map shows the uh, issues of English proficiency. So either the people whose first language is uh, either Portuguese or French, um, their uh, concentration is also happening in the downtown area. So the third map, it shows the health insurance. So the blue dot means that the, they don't have um, uh, proper health, health insurance. It's also relatively concentrated in, in the downtown area. And then it's uh, kind of Surprising that the, in terms of the city of Brockton has a lot of different uh, big hospitals, which is a really comprehensive uh, medical system. Yes. 
Yeah, so continue from the last difference lies. Uh, uh, there is also really stark difference between the home ownership in the downtown area and then not in the downtown area. So the so the these areas means that the people who are uh, um, usually renting their homes rather than the owning their homes, and then especially these areas having the almost uh, over 90 percent of persons are actually rent renting their homes rather than uh, owning their homes. And then the second map also shows that in the shows uh, poverty level of the city, and then these downtown area shows that the in the among the black or African people over 67% of the people are getting paid below the poverty level. <laughs> yeah. Stooling fingers. Sorry, I'll piss off. <laughs> okay. Yeah, as we see in this, um, um, the spatial division, there are also really st stark uh, income disparity. So this graph shows the uh, income distribution of the uh, city of Brockton and then Plymouth County as a comparison. So the yellow, da yellow bars are, are city of Brockton and then the gre green bars are, are Plymouth County. So as you can see that there's a um, really bimodal graph, which means that there are income level is either really low or either really high. So the, actually the medium income of white population is um, 57 and the black population is uh, 47 and then the Hispanics are actually 37, which is definitely not sufficient for support of family or the single adult, uh, which uh, according to the MIT wage calculator, which is also another kind of asset of our school. Our analyses also show that there is a lack of services for Brockton's residents. Um, notably, there has been a lack in affordable housing, despite Brockton meeting all the government mandates for the number of affordable housing units to provide. Um, when looking at the median income in Brockton and the current cost of living, um, there just isn't sufficient affordable housing units. Um, our qualitative research via the interviews have also mentioned a lack of classes in English as a second language educational opportunities. There seems to be a high demand for these workshops and classes, but not enough teachers or room um, for these classes to happen at regular intervals. Um, these interviews have also cited a lack of opportunity in the downtown districts, especially for commercial businesses. Um, for example, there's a lack of pharmacies and grocery stores that has been continuously cited um, despite revitalization efforts. Um, and the last point to note is that Brockton is also obviously well known for its rich healthcare sector jobs, but um, our research has shown that the vast majority of workers in the healthcare sector in Brockton are not actually Brockton residents. Therefore, a large number of Brockton residents have to commute to and from the city to find work. Okay, so after all this analysis, we thought that it would be really important and crucial to bring inclusive economic development for the city. So we went on to study many frameworks that exist out there to, uh, with best, best practices about inclusive economic development. And we designed one framework with one toolkit with best practices for Brockton, considering uh, 10 areas of focus. So we divided like the best practices in peace and social cohesion, leadership and governance, community engagement and culture, land use and physical infrastructure, mobility, real estate, environmental planning, economic opportunity, workforce development, and municipal and social services. This is like a comprehensive toolkit that we design. And considering when we thought about for whom all this development, we considered like every Brocktonian, but especially populations at, at risk, considering race, ethnicity, gender, like and all these aspects specifically to the context of Brockton. So now I'm gonna share some of, of the best practices we included in the action plan we designed for you. It's gonna sound a little bit like an overview and a little bit broad, but they are, um, they are available with more details for you to, to see afterwards. So considering leadership, our action plan uh, recommend like require elected officials to participate in diversity training which is really important to set up like a bar of inclusion in the whole city promote co uh, culture of inclusion through communications and actions 
hold elected officials accountable for inclusive economic development and also extend civic engagement to accessibility for vulnerable, vulnerable groups like uh, offering many different languages, uh, accessibility to these meetings and participation. Uh, so considering the real estate strategies, uh, we, we thought that creating a civic center will be like a core of this project. And many of these best, best practices we are gonna show here informed the design we proposed at the end. Here are broad, but we think that the core of this site development would be creating a civic center for all Brooktonians to get together and create also a community land trust for downtown dis district, implement diverse housing subsidies, establish co-working spaces, create matchmaking systems for sharing commercial space, prioritize local and community oriented capital partners. Thinking about public spaces, we think that they are really important to engage everyone together in diverse meetings. We think, uh, we studied that in Brockton, you don't go too much in the public space, but also you, you all of you uh, liked um, a lot, like the Prova event, so it showed that you has a you have a, like, a big potential to meet in the public space and we recommended some, some ideas like design public spaces, uh, promote workshops to co-create these spaces. The ideas we are gonna show here are just like to spark your co-creation. We are not imposing any design. And then to activate these public spaces, it's really important to consider specific programs. So, like having a communi uh, community facility to host public meetings and activities, workforce development in these centers, like training, language courses, financial education, and also like promote farmers markets, festivals, and like live performance and things to attract people to the public space. And finally, to connect all these things together, we think that it's really important to co-create a comprehensive mobility plan with all residents, because we know that you have like three uh, very important commuter rail stations, but there is uh, like a lack of intra-city micro-mobility to connect all the neighborhoods together and especially uh, give accessibility to specific parts of the neighborhood and connect with the downtown area we are gonna talk about. So when it came to figuring out where to actually implement these ideas, we asked Rob where we should look, um, and he recommended the what was formerly called the CSX site, now called the Downtown Trout Brook Redevelopment District. Um, because the city had uh, recently completed an urban renewal plan for it that won an award from the uh, American Planning Association. Um, so we were excited about taking a look at this site, um, which is adjacent to downtown. Uh, the specific site we're looking at is uh, the southwest corner. So we're really anchored by the railroad uh, line right adjacent to the Brockton MBTA station, the bus center, uh, the Catholic Charities facility, the, the police department. Um, and we really just wanted to work here because there's already been so much thought and effort um, gone into the logistics of redeveloping this site. Um, so here you can see kind of what exists around it. Um, there's single family um, housing both to the north and east. And then of course the uh, along Court Street, it is currently a, a zone for industrial. So this is what the site looks like today. There are condos, uh, so co-lofts um, in the building in the front um, that is partially affordable. And then an industrial building owned by Verizon that is currently underutilized. So of those buildings, of course, stay in our plan, um, but you'll see that the development happens around those two existing buildings. So the intervention that we are proposing is to transform this site into a vibrant campus that's really anchored by the One Brockton Center, um, but also includes mixed income housing, retail and commercial space, educational space, and um, recreational uh, space. 
Uh, the idea is to not redevelop the 3.4 acres in one fell swoop, but rather to think about how to do phased development um, so that residents can actually participate um, in the planning process um, to decrease the development risk for the private investors and also to um, promote the opportunity for residents to have equity in the projects. Okay, so if you look at the site, the reason that we chose to focus on that particular corner is because of the scale. So as you can note, there's something larger about that particular corner of the site, right? There's larger buildings there, there's an opportunity to sort of engage with a larger form for us to sort of take note of this space which is already enclosed in some form or fashion. Uh, it's also pretty close to an existing street, so it's readily uh, accessible. Um, this is why we actually chose that corner. Now, in this model, you can see that we keep these two uh, existing buildings. What you can quickly see here is that what's missing is actually a, a, a network of roads. It's not as easy as you would imagine to sort of navigate through this site. And so really the first phase that we think is appropriate here is to introduce this road network, right? It integrates the site into the fabric of the city. This is crucial because it means that we have to rethink the network and the way that people move through the site. So this means, as, uh, as we talked about, right, like moving with, uh, with bikes, with, um, with buses, all of these things to replace the, the sort of more uh, private car focus that, that Brockton currently has, especially in this area. And so once the, this network is introduced, now we have an opportunity to build on it, right? So we basically introduced two different spaces here. Uh, I don't know how this works. Can one finger? Cool. <laughs> All right. So what we're saying basically is this space, which is enclosed by the two buildings, represents an opportunity for a, a civic gesture, right? This, this, this would be like a multi-purpose space for uh, a, a market event. And originally or initially what this would be is a space for um, more temporal use. So that would be like in the weekends, for example, people would come here, right? There would be food trucks and such so that people who already have in their mind that this is a space that they could visit that represents uh, uh, a space for folks to come together. Now, on the opposite side right here is more of a commercial space, meaning that this is an F&B, so food and beverage, or a, large, a larger retailer that uh, is, again, facing the, uh, facing the street, which is why we think it's important. And at the back of it, what you see is a, is a more of a garden opportunity, or uh, sort of a community garden at the back that sort of takes advantage of its vicinity to the, uh, to the new retail center. Now, once that's developed, what we uh, offer is basically to develop the, the back of the site, right? So what we're saying is we introduce two other buildings at the back, right? So this would be uh, one of the centers we talked about, which is currently lacking, is more of an uh, educational facility. So this means either something towards a, a co-working space or a learning center for, uh, for training, essentially. And what it does, it, it, it feeds off the energy of the communal space that we already know is there from the previous uh, step, right? And what we see here, again, is a similar community space that operates very similar to, the, to this one, and it has a large outdoor recreational space introduced here by these two um, uh, courts. Now, once that's set, right, we basically have uh, a campus that's already fully activated, that's easily or readily uh, accessible with uh, multiple forms of mobility, right? And what we're saying is, okay, now it's time to build up. Now it's time to increase density in the site. And the big move here, the most important thing that we think is crucial is this building right here, represented in the rendering right there. Now, I do not want you to focus on the design here. The design is not important. What's important are the components that we think are crucial, which means the interaction with the street, right? So this entire thing can work without the building on top, which is the first step. The building atop is something that we introduce. It's, uh, it's sort of a secondary component. Uh, what the goal here is to say, uh, this is really a civic gesture. This is a place that you can uh, identify the entire site through, right? Uh, and again, what you see here is, uh, is residential, up above the existing space, so introducing uh, affordable componentry uh, to the existing site. Now, here you see this portion of the site fully developed. At this point, you have 75% of affordable housing. The reason we think this, this demands such a high component of affordability is that it all sits atop of a commercial 
sorry, more of a, a civic gesture that you see here. And it's, it's all operating as a single unit, or that's the idea here. It all operates again in conjunction with the existing infrastructure underneath. So there's no moving things away. There's only adding things so that we add to the density of the site. Now, once that is built, uh, you already have this as a functioning sort of new district. There's an opportunity, right, to keep that energy and utilize it to introduce an entirely new area to the site. So this would mean three additional buildings. We're not saying that they all need to be developed together, but we are saying that this is a great opportunity to introduce new residential componentry that's a little bit more, let's say, subdued, or it doesn't have as much of a civic gesture here, except it, what it does contribute is a large public space. So you have an ice rink, you have a big uh, similar, but a little bit more private communal space right here, again, civic gesture, that's a little bit tucked away. So you keep that sort of um, buffer between the uh, train stations that, that, that goes through there. Um, and so our general idea here is that this, this would be a sort of a new civic district. There's 365 of uh, units in this site, right? What we think is important to note here are not necessarily the amount of square footage, but the ratios. So that means that if we're talking about a civic space that doesn't uh, basically appear as an afterthought, right? If we think of what a developer would do coming into the site, this would be uh, a, a linchpin in the development of the site, right? There would be all of these units would basically contribute to the development of the, civics, of the two civic spaces in the site. Um, there's a breakdown of the square footages here. Again, the point is to note that there's, a, there's less demand on parking. So only 2% of the entire square footage of the site is dedicated to parking, which is very little. Again, because this is oriented to be a, a TOD, right? A transportation-oriented development, such that most of the transportation through the site is not done by private cars. These two buildings, right? are again oriented towards either community or educational spaces with a very slight uh, uh, retail component. But we do feel that as this thing gets developed, there's opportunity to introduce more retail. And again, the anchor of this entire site uh, is really this, this uh, space that's created th between these two existing buildings, capturing the existing energy and really introducing this uh, intersection with the street as people move through this existing court street and through this new sort of artery that moves through the, the site itself. And, and so really the point here is less about the building and more about what this does to the existing street. Uh, when we visited here, it, it really seemed like a missed opportunity to sort of re-engage the street, really invest in that infrastructure that's critical for this entire site. Um, Again, you see here these uh, transportation sort of elements that we talked about, intersection with the street, the ability to sort of go a little bit higher off the ground so you get clearer visibility in transportation. Uh, again, this rendering could, could look a thousand different ways. What we're saying here really is take this opportunity to, uh, to say, look, uh, let's create a competition, for example, right? Let's reach out to the entire population the, of, of you know, Boston. Let's get people interested in this space. Let's get folks interested in this civic space so that investment could be generated through it. Thank you. All right, so we have a good amount of time here to take questions, thoughts, comments. Um, this, as Yair really emphasized, is, uh, was really more of a learning exercise for us and is meant to serve as inspiration for the city and future development that is already in the pipeline here. Um, so we have, some, we have a thing to take notes on, because we definitely want to um, kind of incorporate what you guys say into um, our next iteration of the design. We're submitting this to a design competition um, and re would really appreciate hearing your thoughts. So I'm going to try to find a good way to say this. Um, Point the microphone. Yes. Thank you. So all of the research that you've done that brought you to this point, we've seen projects like this in Boston. It's happening a lot. Um, that same research that you used about the disparities, in the end, when projects like this are implemented, those disparities still exist, but they just move into another town or city. 
So have you thought about that? What are your thoughts on that? Um, we've seen it happen over and over. That's probably what happened to Brockton because of Boston. Um, how do we combat that? Because we want to empower the people in this community to get excited about a project like this. We want to educate them. We want to train them, especially our youth. We want them to stay and be able to benefit from a project like this. We don't want to bring a project like this into the city and then push the issues that we have into the next city. So how do you? So this is kind of a critical question as we're studying urban planning and in all contexts across the, the world, really, which is how can you ensure that development like this does not lead to gentrification and displacement for people who have lived in the downtown district for decades? Um, and so one strategy that we've learned about is creating some sort of community agreement in which that kind of incorporates a district that maybe already exists or creates new boundaries um, that includes business, business owners, landowners, people that are renting out units to think about how can we maintain a certain level of affordability. Like for example, not raise rent so that businesses can't afford to stay in their space or not raise rent so families are forced to go to another municipality. Um, so I think that's, that's one strategy, but that's really the central question here that we are continuing to learn about. Do you guys have any other thoughts? We also included in the toolkit like detailed instructions of strategies and tools to like really engage the real people in this development so that they can benefit from the increased development. So community land trusts, for example, it's a great example of how to include people to own this, the spaces. There's also like uh, incentives for people to uh, not just own the houses, but also like commercial spaces and share within like two business, one space so that it becomes affordable for people to own it and not just be displacement, displaced afterwards. There's also like a crucial thing about our design uh, uh, on the timing of it. Sometimes it's just like a, an imp a development that just come done by a, an outside developer that is really quickly and this does not allow for public participation. So this is why the phasing part is so important so that there is time for public meetings, for participation, for workshops, for you to decide together how you are going to do this and also train people and empower people to participate in a in a good way and this is all like financially feasible for developers so it's crucial to develop like a, like a real guidelines for the developers to uh, align with the strategies you want to to work with to engage these people in the development Uh, thank you. So I understand that uh, listening to the presentation, the first two years there was some focus on uh, life sciences and then, then you switched over to this model uh, to kind of take into account some of the needs of Brockton. Just going back to the life sciences uh, aspect, um, just wondering if there was a conversation with the stakeholders uh, in Boston that are currently uh, in the life sciences business. Um, and gauging their need for expansion and whether, um, you know, Brockton would be a desirable location for the expansion of the life sciences in Boston. I know you guys kind of took a left turn yeah. and maybe the life sciences thing went into the wayside or, but yeah. If, so what we did in year two was to look at the assets that you have that are complements to life sciences. So you've got four hospitals, you've got a medical, you've got a clinic. Do you know that there's a, that there has been a thousand research projects written up in articles that have been done on Brockton, in Brockton's populations? So one of the things we did was look at PubMeds, which is a database of, of uh, academic articles. And over the life of that database, there has been a substantial amount of research that's been done on Brockton because it looks more like America than downtown Longwood. 
It looks a lot more like America than the, the western suburbs of Massachusetts. So if you're a scientist and you're interested in rolling out a pro project or a product or a, a, a medical procedure, you're not looking for a place that's already uh, fully formed and all the connections are made. You're looking for a place that looks like America, which is much more diverse and much more complicated. Uh, and so that was sort of a um, kind of a clue to us about the fact that maybe Brockton needs to be thought of as a place where by thinking about community health and really focusing on improving the health of the citizens of the, the community and, you, and incorporating the medical centers and facilities that you have, you may be able to over a significant period of time, not an overnight type of change, be able to have Brockton become some kind of an example for what healthcare delivery and healthcare innovation within the non-major um, medical center uh, situations might be possible. Another thing that we looked at um, was the role of logistics. So interspersed in your economy, you have a number of, of uh, rather large organizations that are logistics firms. What do they do? They store stuff, they move stuff, they um, uh, recombine things, and then they place them in other locations. And you actually have a, a relatively high-performing logistics firm that has a, a, a set of facilities that are more than just a shed-like um, uh, storage space, right? It's got conditioned air, it's got uh, high security and various other kind of features. Well, what happens in the complex here? Four or five times a year, one of these big companies tears down a lab and packages up the equipment and either puts it into the third or into the, the you know the third market, right? Not the, the original producer, the second use, but another market, or they store it until they get another project where they're expecting to utilize those pieces of equipment again. Every time that has to happen, the piece of equipment has to be taken down, it has to be certified, has to be moved, be recertified, stored, and then it goes through that process again when it goes into its next application. So you have logistics functions, WB Mason. You've got one of the, you know, the uh, most um, nimble uh, service companies in, in the Boston area when it comes to moving um, office equipment. But, and we, we spoke with folks at W.B. Mason. The thing that was fascinating is you know why they're successful? Because they take the paper to the machine in the buildings that they serve. So it's not that they just drop it in the front door and say, here, you carry it up 10 flights of stairs or put it on the elevator. They actually put it in the coffee room, and they put coffee in the coffee room. So they have this completely different emotional relationship with their customers. So thinking about those as fragments, they're not consolidated. And it will take time for consolidation to occur. But I can only say from what we've been told, Brockton has tremendous potential. And having it be a community of consolidated interests is really critical because the other places that companies are looking at look a little bit more, you know, put together, but may not have the same kind of wealth and the same opportunity. But the sense is, you know, is Brockton working together, everybody together, for a solution for the future? Just to add on that, I think after reading like all the studies that have been made here in Brockton, we said, what is missing, why action is not taking place there. And we found that like the inclusion part was missing from all of this. All the studies that people from outside made were not like engaging local people in the study. So this is why we are like encouraging you to like get together and start as a community, as a one community taking action. And then many of the studies could, be, could happen if you decide you want to. I'll just add one more thing is that if you do want to read about what we research when it comes to life sciences and specific opportunities in Brockton, where, when, who, how much, that's in the second year report. Uh, so you have the, the first year report is on the table, the, the kind of thicker thing. The, what we passed out is just the third chapter of this year's report, but then last year's report has all of the life science research.
Let's say, was there another question over here? It's more of a statement. Well, first of all, thank you very much. This is it's beautiful. The renderings are beautiful. Um, and thank you for the time you've spent on this. We really appreciate it here in Brockton. I just have one question, and I know you kind of explained how you got to the parking pot to keep it minimal, but having grown up here and being an elected official here, parking is the first thing that comes up with anything. So I think it's crucial for this project to even move forward. We have to add parking. Otherwise, we won't get any of the residents that live a little bit of, uh, on the other side of the bridge or on the other side of the train tracks. So we, we have, if we're going to be inclusive, it has to be for everybody, and we have to find some sort of a parking solution because it, <coughs> We really need it. We actually have a parking garage that's coming up. We can't wait for it to open because it's already filled up. So um, that was just my comment. And the other question I had was on the studies. And I, I'm sorry if I missed it in the beginning. I was a few minutes late, so I apologize. But how did you do you get to your numbers of you know poverty levels, um, language? I saw you, your maps with your graphs with the dots. How did you get to those? that information. Yeah, so to answer this question, so actually that kind of data is really available on the census um, data. So the so actually for the 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 demographic change data is from census ninety, census 20, 2010, at uh, yeah, twenty ten and uh, Amer American Communi Community Survey two thousand seventeen. So, and then all of the other kind of demographics data, including languages and citizenship, all of the things, home ownership is coming from the American Community Survey is a kind of subset of the census data, which is a, so the so main census is a 10, uh, 10 year gap. And so we need to fill this gap into five year gaps or the three years gap. So I use the five year kind of community survey data. So it's a really official kind of data set. I think it's a valid point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never give me a microphone. Um, thank you again for coming out. I, I thought the concept of, of additive, of starting small and then adding something to it, and it looks like you have, you know, a preliminary building goes in and then you've built something else over the top of it, and then you build something to the next of it, and so you're, you're adding and adding and adding as you go. Um, over a long period of time, or you know, a couple of years, what is? Or have you given any thought to the economics of that, of, of having lay down space? And once you've created this this first phase, and it's a one or two story building, and you've landscaped it, and then you're going to go back and tear that up to throw another section on top of that. And what are the economics of all, of all of that? Is is one, and then two. This is very heavy on. Um, residential, was there a way, given that we're right at the train station, we're 30 minutes to South Station, we have a kick-ass fiber bundle, it's a professional planning term, that runs through this area and, and connects to Kendall Square and New York. Um, we don't see a lot of, of office or higher end commercial activity. Um, as opposed to the you know first floor retail and and residents above. Any thoughts? I get to keep it. Right. So to the first point, which is how do you actually do incremental development? And so my own experience is in Texas. And so what we usually do there, right, is it's pretty straightforward. So you have the slab, you overbuild the foundations to support that extra development. And sure, there's, uh, there's added cost to that preliminary shit stage. Uh, and there's also parts of it require sort of you um, putting down some of your money on something that might take actually longer to happen. Uh, so I want to break this down into two components, right? One is the sort of the physicality of the dimensions, right? So you're saying, say these buildings that, that we're seeing in the plan, say like these buildings, right? They're 150 feet over 60. So you can imagine that being added to in two ways. One, that's sort of a standard plate for, uh, for uh, a parking lot. 
So if you had really wanted to, if parking was an issue, you simply add two more levels of parking, and then up above that, you would add the, either the residential, or conversely, you can per, sort of reprogram that so that it becomes, a, a, let's say, a multifunctional space. I don't know if office necessarily works. From our analysis here, it seems like, uh, let's say, office is not necessarily in high demand right now. If things change, maybe there's a discussion there. I agree with the point that there's high access to uh, to say trading or stuff like that, where you have, where that ability to be closer to the network is a, is an added value. Uh, I don't know. I think it's a big question. I think the sort of the lower hanging fruit for sure is to, to do residential. Uh, and once that's working and and you know fully developed, then the opportunity to say, okay, you know what, I have enough sort of stable income from that. Uh, people might want to actually you know live in this apartment, and work next door. That's a completely legitimate point. And the way we're imagining it is like this whole slab underneath could for sure be some sort of, uh, let's say again, multifunctional space that incorporates some sort of, uh, of an employment situation, right? Uh, the second point was, remind me of that again, sorry? Uh, the second point, which is actually the first, was mm -hmm. what are the costs of, or now you've disrupted the site yeah. to build on top of this thing. And, you know, I, I noticed in, in one of your earlier presentations that there was this park that kept moving so and you don't see that anymore? No, well, um, but it was, it was an interesting idea because you were using temporary use of space and then something else would replace it mm -hmm. and that park would move. Um, you don't see, well, you see some of that in here because you had a community garden in the front building mm -hmm. that kind of goes when you add the, the next floor. Do people get emotionally attached to spaces because everybody loves to do a pop-up thing and then it becomes something else. And right. Oh. And then what are the costs behind that disruption? So, so let me ask you, are you familiar with uh, the sidewalk, Google sidewalk experiment in, um, in Canada? Yes. So there's huge opposition to it. There's huge opposition, but there's also great innovation. Can we agree on that? The, the great innovation that they propose is actually the reduction on. Thought, and nothing broken ground, but yeah. Sure, but so the great innovation there is in terms of the fabrication of the residential components. Uh, so that the, the time to construct is actually very, very short. They use timber fabrication, all done in, uh, basically in factories and then assembled on site and basically a fraction of the time that it would take you to build a standard development. Now all of these, right, it's, a, it's sort of a standard sort of five over two typology. And so what we imagine is most of this stuff is actually fabricated elsewhere, brought to the site and implemented very quickly. So you don't have a huge, uh, you know, a huge, construction site that, site. yeah, don't have that. It's very, very fast. Again, building on that, what, what we think is an excellent, excellent precedent by Google. Okay. I'd like to just say one thing in, in response also to this. It might not seem like more people is a good idea, but in the case of Brockton now, adding to your population, you have the potential to do it. And when you add to your population, you add to the circulation of income, potential circulation of income. What that enables is the retail and the other functions that go with an increasingly uh, urban area. In the absence of additional population, you're going to have to have everybody going out, as they do now, earning their income and coming in and supporting um, retail, which they may not have, you may not have the capacity to do that right now. So adding to your population base is a way for you to actually grow this way and also grow this way in the way, in the size of your economy. You may actually be, believe it or not, not quite big enough. Well, we do want to be respectful of your time at 6 o'clock. We will stick around for more questions back and forth. Yes. Well, I think we, we just want to thank you. Thank you. Answering, but yes. if people need to leave, feel free. If you have dinner plans, we will not be back when you leave, but we're happy to continue to take questions. Um, I kind of wanted to retouch base with the data um, that you came up with as far as uh, the wage is concerned from, you know, uh, the, uh, the white population, black population, Hispanic population. And the subset of data that you collected to get those numbers for the, for the medium income, um, what, those type of jobs, were they all in the same sector uh, across the board? Or did you, you know, utilize, you know, um, 
each population had a different sort of uh, income base that uh, it was generating from. Um, was there jobs that were from within Brockton or a uh, commuting population that that contributed from? I, I asked that because it, it kind of speaks to the wage inequality that we're seeing around here. And so I kind of want you to kind of touch base on that a little bit more. Um, and my, the second part to this, to, uh, to this is um, what economic effects do you see with adding 365 units, I believe you said, uh, to this, to the overall um, economic growth um, in Brockton, numbers wise, percentage wise? So I don't know if I understand the question correctly, but um, yeah. So using census data is always kind of have a kind of trap or hole. So the, it always doesn't it represent all of the things. So it always captures a part of the stories or the, or the stories that we are interested in. And then it somehow reflects the bias. So it's always happening in this area. So I was. I'm always kind of aware of those kind of, you know, the, this kind of reflection is, is always partial. So yeah, it's, it's always a big question mark that if I kind of use for the data for, you know, the advocating something. So yeah, so for the income level, so there's a, in this official kind of census data, there's a, um, it says, there's a clear kind of racial gap between the 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 races, but um, yeah, I'm kind of agree that and there's other kind of truth is behind that. So, but we, since we don't have data yet, so we kind of we don't have yeah we don't have the kind of full kind of stories in here. But the data in the census you got was just the number of income and not the source of income, right? Yes. But we mm -hmm. could find in the census the source of income right. and give you this data. You could be comparing, you know, nurses mm -hmm. um, and plumbers to people who work at a mattress factory. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it wouldn't be apples to apples. Yeah. Yeah, but since it's like a sample of everyone for, for each, like, ethnic group, mm -hmm. it includes all the professions and sources of income of that group. Yeah. So we could find the sources for each group a little bit to give insights if you want. And all the wages that are used are for the city of Brockton, correct? Like not for people who are commuting to Brockton to work. Yeah. They're all for Brockton. Well, and then for your second question about economic growth, I no. think that's that would definitely be like a. A ne like a so what question. So it's like we know the benefits of the Civic Center and reactivating the street, the Court Street, um, the impact of having you know a couple hundred more families downtown. But you know what happens when it comes to job growth, or how does that affect the the redevelopment that's already happened in Brockton um, with the the kind of renovated storefronts and retail space. Um, so we, we didn't really dig into that, but we I, I'm certainly curious to to think more about what this, how this impacts the city as a whole, economically. So I can give you a rule of thumb, and that is for every one unit, multiply it by four, and just take an average, take a, a, a 2.1 or 2.2, you know, three uh, size of a family and multiply it by the units, and if, if, no, if nobody in the community moved into those units, and you had to fill them up with new residents, talking about 378 times four, so 1,200 additional people. I just did a really grossly rough estimate. And so I took 350 units and multiplied that times the median income of Brockton, you know, let's say 55,000 per, per household. That came out to $19 million of money that is being, that is right there that is people who can go out and shop and buy things, pay for their rent, um, that's a nice chunk of change. The other uh, answer to your question about the sectoral composition of the three categories, they are different. 
right? And you're exactly right. There are groups of people that are particularly within certain kinds of job categories today. What Brockton needs is more higher paying jobs. Mm -hmm. and it, and, but it needs a pathway for that to actually be possible. So it's not that people can't do it, it's that there's infrastructure necessary for people to move forward from the skills that they have now to employment opportunities of the future. And it, that takes public infrastructure in the form of education, ESL, um, that's why we built in a, a working space so that there could be training opportunities for people. Chris had a question? Um, I just wanted to congratulate you. This is an amazing project. It's the renderings, the ideas are very interesting. I just didn't hear mention of any um, discussion about um, environmental impacts. Brockton always has issues with uh, water usage and um, trash issues. So I'm just wondering how did you address these in your project? It's a great question. Uh, Trash is an interesting point. We did not necessarily think about that. What has been, uh, what we did pay a lot of attention to is the aspect of flooding and resilience, right? So all of these units are elevated above the floodplain. And what you see here, you see this, it's a little bit harder to see, but there's an arrow here, which represents the flow of basically of excess water from waterfall. And so most of these spaces that you see in the middle, what they do basically is they, uh, they're programmed to uh, absorb water, right? So, the theory here is that this is uh, this is a resilient district, right? So you don't you don't necessarily get flooding, and the, the portion of the, of the sites that do get flooding, uh, they're not necessarily hard or critical infrastructure. And what you do see here is an, uh, is a buffer of, uh, of basically you know it, it reduces noise that's coming from the train that's coming by, but it also represents a you know a green infrastructure that that carries that. Uh, I hope that answers the question. But to your question about water supply, the entire region is oblivious to the problem of water supply. I live on the other side of uh, Hingham, and uh, uh, we already know that the Weir River at the upper part of it runs dry in the summer now. So, you know, we as a region really didn't think about our water supply because it isn't what it was in the past. We would be happy to sell you our uh, water and sewage. No, no, no. so. <laughs> So hi, I'm uh, Chris Cooney with the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. We're right across the street, and we had conducted uh, a study not long ago on the CSX property, as, as you're aware. Uh, first of all, I love the fact that you're saying that Brockton uh, is ahead of the rest of the country. Uh, we look like what the U.S. will look like in 2050, 2055, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's nice to hear that that's uh, mentioned as a strength, because I think, I think it's huge. Um, it, this reminds me a little bit of Assembly Square in terms of how you've laid out the road system uh, with a little less commercial and retail and, a, and uh, office and a little more housing. I think that's fantastic. Um, in your study, uh, well, one, one other quick point uh, to the gentleman's uh, uh, point about building and then going up from that. So the garage, the closest garage to this site was built to handle four levels. It has two today. So this giant capacity just across the street at the BAT Intermodal Center to go up another two levels. Uh, so that's already in place. Um, so to your point about growth, um, this city, many of its, much of its infrastructure was designed to handle a much larger population than it is today. It was projected in the late 50s and 60s that we might be at 150,000 people today. Uh, our uh, wastewater treatment center was uh, built, a uh, facility was built to handle 40 40 million gallons a day uh, in the largest gravity-fed uh, disposal system in the country, um, yet half of it's mothballed right now. So when we talk about housing, uh, one other quick fact that came out last week, our city schools are down by 1,000 students this year over last year. Tremendous, right? So there's something happening here, and there's an opportunity for housing. So this would just replace uh, a, a portion of the school population, not, never mind the rest. I can tell you, in my 22 years, I've never seen so many uh, buildings, more than 20 uh, properties, uh, that are kind of lined up and ready to go for housing, mostly because of the pressure in Boston, but also because the governor's policies are, are 
pressing us in that direction. And I think with all the rail and all the infrastructure and all the inf uh, investment that's been made here, Rockton is a natural for additional housing. My question is, in your study, did you identify growth potential in terms of how much the city, how many people the city can handle uh, in, in, in your uh, estimation? And studies that may have touched on that. It's a funny story. Um, we, 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 we as a class started out on two sides of a room. I, the conventional, and they not. And then eventually we kind of came together in the middle realizing what we saw was a sort of necessary ingredient, which was add more carefully, thoughtfully, in conjunction with how, what people feel here in Brockton. And, but we didn't do population projections. I mean, we, it's, uh, we just didn't do it. But you have had, like, with the CSX st site study, your master plan study, um, your district studies, you've, all, you've got population projections within them. We, we just didn't aggregate it all. Just, and, and by the way, we have asked Old Colony Planning Council through their direct technical assistance program to manage a study to find a, a local-ish university to figure out what that optimal number is. How much can we grow and, and not sabotage, but actually support the school system? How do we grow to create um, and attract the kind of, of workers that we need? And just as importantly, working with, with Sheila and, and mass hires, um, what is it, mass hires Brockton area? What, whatever they're calling it. So Bay Web for the old timers. Um, how do we create a middle class? Not just import one, but how do we create one? So how do we take the, the assets that we have here in education and, and you can see this incredible uh, career ladder that has started in the life sciences, the investments that have been made by the Mass Life Science Center in Brockton High School and the Boys and Girls Club uh, to bring people into STEM, to connect them from Brockton High School to Massasoit to Bridgewater um, to, you know, and it's not just exporting those workers someplace else. There is a small but growing uh, life science sector here. And one of the things that we hope to be able to do is to get those folks together to find out what kinds of, of uh, job qualifications they need so that, that Baywib and or Mass Hires and um, Massasoit and working with Life Science Center can help make sure that we have those careers so that Brockton residents are filling those positions, not just importing people from outside. Yeah, that was my phone. I got a thumbs up. That was good. Thank you. feeling 25 years ago. And now uh, they basically said we will handle it and we'll deal with it with best practices. And Quincy is fuller than it's ever been. Uh, but the traffic is flowing uh, in a smoother way. They've, they've uh, addressed choke points. Uh, they've streamlined uh, uh, pedestrian crossings wherever they needed to in order to make it a little smoother. So I, 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 I can tell you, in dealing with the property owners who are a little bit w reluctant to put their money down because they're worried that this fear is not allayed, it, this is information that's going to need to be out there in terms of how big can the city grow and still be comfortable. who are still willing to stay and talk. Really interesting discussion, really bold proposal. My question really relates to financial feasibility, and this is part of what I do every day is to try to figure out how to make this kind of inclusive development feasible. I don't, oh, that's a bad omen. Um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna oversimplify it and say as I look at the different elements, there's a lot of elements here that are sort of net subsidy drawers, right? They require a lot of public investment or subsidy, and there are certain parts of the, the development plan that are 
there are ways to finance that, like affordable housing. There are streams of, of subsidy for that. If you have enough patients and can wait in line for resources long enough and you have smart developers, you might be able to do all the affordable housing you want to do. But there's not that many pieces of this development that are going to generate revenue or bring um, tax revenue into either tax revenue or, or other forms of revenue into the community. And I just wondered if you thought much about that or did much financial feasibility planning, because there is a question of what would all this development cost this community? Um, because there are pieces of this that there really aren't um, consistent streams of subsidy available outside of the community um, for, you know, community space and community. There, I mean, there are some sources, but it's hard to come by. So long question, bottom line, how are you going to make this all financially feasible? We have a, you know, a general discounted cash flow model, some sensitivity analysis, right? Mm -hmm. And the general idea of the, you know, the waterfall here, uh, to say that it's all, absolutely not. Uh, but we do feel that there's a feasibility. Uh, that's part of the reason that it's uh, parsed this way, it's phased this way. So <laughs> this kind of project, um, it doesn't necessarily require the calculations behind it, but we did do the calculations behind it, primarily because of the skill base of the students and the ability for them to be able to do it um, from the standpoint of the physical site. But there are always unintended consequences and there are spillover effects, positive and negative. And those are the kinds of things that you would put into a much longer, much more encompassing economic analysis to, to determine how would you manage so that it balanced. Oh, here we go. I didn't see you. Sorry. I didn't dare raise my hand because I know you're supposed to be out of here at 6 o'clock. Um, I'm touching on what Councillor Asex said and the gentleman that was here earlier. And uh, it's on the data. I noticed the, uh, it mentioned 2009 for the, uh, the uh, what you call French and Portuguese speaking, which are really Haitian Creole and Cape Verde um, Creola. So the other thing is, in 2010 was the disastrous earthquake in Haiti. And the increase of Haitians that have come here, many of them are very well educated. There are many artists. Um, and with that art coming, the art uh, community has really grown in the city. And I mean, it's just gentrified. We're becoming gentrified, don't you think, Shirley? <laughs> I mean, really. Um, it's just exciting. But, but also, uh, along with many of the uh, Cape Verdeans and the Haitians, um, we also have a, quite an influx from South America and Central America. We also have quite an influx of Africans coming. So they, and um, I happen to belong to a, um, a, I'm going to call it an African church because it is kind even though I'm white. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my pastor is from Nigeria. But we have six Nigerians that have, since they've come here in the last 10 years, become registered nurses. That is going to bring our income, median income up a lot. There are many, many more students uh, going into nursing, which is a very well-paying uh, paying profession. Um, I think that's all I need to say, but I, I just want you to know, since the mayoral uh, election especially, the people in Brockton, all the different cultures and races, have come together. We have been, I feel it, I think a lot of other people are feeling, I mean, the love that's going on now, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be corny, this is happening and it's wonderful. I've been here 52 years and I've never seen such progress of the groups getting together. We used to always complain with Brockton Neighbors United, we can't get them to come. We can't get them to come. And we're all these white people, you know, and most of us, you know, lower middle income or middle income people ourselves, work, a lot of them working in social services, and we all know what that pays um, and requires at least a master's degree. Um, but anyway, it's, it's just like a multiplier effect, but it's a good multiplier effect. I did want to say one more thing, and that's about affordable housing. We already have and had for many, many years more than our share of affordable housing. And it has affected us. We have a school system that uh, has 
a very high rate of disabled children and English as, a, uh, as their second language, it, the cost associated with that is so high, the, in, the American born students are suffering for it and the people who have been living here. The education system we boast about, but I think sometimes we're boasting because we want to boast. We have to be truthful with each other and we have to understand what effects are. And every, but the good news is we're all working together now. But I am not for more affordable housing. Market rate, um, uh, workforce housing, yes. We, we were going to have some and it got taken away, but we still, I, I understand that there are some, some workforce in, in effect. Um, we can't have any more children in our schools. We can't handle them without further costs. So that's something that has to be brought in with these growing families. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Just to clarify what I was saying, what happened is we went through a phase a few years, in the last few years, where we had um, an influx of students in our uh, school system, but we weren't getting enough funding from the state mm -hmm. because of the formula, because we had many, uh, for, for whatever reasons, we weren't getting enough funding. But that has uh, changed this year. The superintendent did what um, Chris Cooney from the chamber just mentioned. They did do a study, and we are um, we have lost a lot of students, so we can use the students from you know an increase in our um, student body in our schools. But um, Eleanor what was mentioning we did go through a few years where we were bursting at the seams and not getting enough funding to educate them. Our classrooms were, you know, 25, 30 plus students in a classroom. They weren't, you know, there were more bodies than they were chairs, so it was very tough. But um, I know this year that they just came out with that study, I believe just last week. Yes. Yes, and we got some funding, but, you know, for this year, hopefully it continues, but for this year, I think we'll. Where we're ahead, but thank you. I think this is the last comment to make. Um, I to speak to why we chose to include so much below market rate housing in this plan. Um, the city had commissioned a study, I'm forgetting what, what the, the firm was, but that showed that there really is a gap between the median income and the, the rent prices um, in Brockton. And so there's a concept called um, ha being housing poor, which is when you compare your income to what you're paying in housing. And so according to this report, about 24% of Brockton residents are paying more than 50% of their income in rent, and about 25% are paying more than 30%. So about half the city is what um, kind of the planning standard calls housing poor. And so when you think about affordable housing, there's so many different kinds of affordable housing, all it, which includes workforce housing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you know, public housing that's, you know, or um, there's Section 8 vouchers. You can think of anything below um, market rate is really what we consider housing. It's a or affordable housing. It's a really large umbrella. So big differences. And that's a misconception uh, what's happened with Brockton. We have, from a lot of the surrounding towns, we do have a lot of low-income housing. So that's a misconception where workforce and market rate sometimes don't work. Exactly. Like you could kind of create a, a, a diagram of affordable housing. You have many different types of subsidies and programs and strategies that, that make it just more basic. It does boil down to making it more affordable for families to be able to stay in the community that, that they've been in. Well, thank you all so much for your fantastic questions and for um, being here, for coming here on a, a Tuesday evening. Um, we will be sharing our full report soon, um, and we it's available to the public. So we have um, you know, your contact information from Rob, and um, we look forward to continuing to engage with Brockton over the next few months. And if you haven't signed in yet, feel free to do so on the pen pad over there. About a month, we have the second one that's just ready, ready to be printed, and the third one is formatted to be printed. So it'll be a three, three set volume. <laughs> Thank you.